Uh, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel are resident adversaries on the weekly PBS program Sneak Previews. They're both very well-respected film critics based in Chicago, and both have extensive backgrounds in print and broadcast reporting. Together, they've added a new twist to film criticism, and the audiences seem to love it. Uh, please welcome. It's uh, fun to have these gentlemen with us. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. Give that film four stars. You like that? Huh? I like the film. Uh, there was a, it, it imitates a film we just saw, Venom, which had a snake's point of view. Here's a dog's mm -hmm. point of view. These films, in all it, seriousness, these films are more interesting than some of the junk that we have to sit through. Disney live action pictures, Neil Simon's comedies. That little thing. <laughs> Whoa! Well, we're taking care of Brando it and Neil it. Simon tonight. <laughs> It needs uh, Klaus Kinski to be bitten by the dog. <laughs> uh, I think your show is terrific, by the way. Thank I you. saw it Saturday night, and uh, I guess for... for <laughs> most people, when a, a motion picture critic uh, image comes to mind, most people think of somebody who is kind of goofy, uh, too esoteric, too intellectual, or on the other hand, kind of bitchy and goofy. And uh, right. uh, You guys just seem... That's kind of the ambiance we try to recreate. <laughs> <on the show. laughs> you guys are just nice, uh, reasonable fellows uh, reviewing films. I think we're film uh, lovers. Mm -hmm. We're fans. We like films. We like to see good films. We're disappointed when we see bad ones. And we talk about them to each other, I think, the way a lot of people talk about movies to each other. This yeah. is the thing I heard. I mean, I, we were, I was in New York over the weekend, and people said, you're fans. That's what we like. You sound the way we sound when we talk about films. Uh, that doesn't mean that we can't talk about a serious concept uh, or serious films. Uh, it's just that we do it from a point of view of loving the work, appreciating it, and not taking cheap shots. When I said the Neil Simon remark, that may have sounded like a cheap shot, but it is based on having sat through mm -hmm. a lot of his films, and they are not particularly good of late. Ever since he moved to California, I don't think coincidentally, uh, he uh, has not done very good work. And mm. I, I would just say it honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His films are usually better than uh, movies like Master of the Flying Guillotine, though, which you see in <laughs> theaters where your feet stick to the floor and people open up cans of tab all over your head. That's very... Right. <laughs> but the that's problem is he's, he's adapting these things from plays, and mm -hmm. the seams show. Mm -hmm. The Goodbye Girl was written originally for the screen, and I think that's the best film. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the origin of this show? How did you guys get together and... Uh... We started about six years ago in Chicago with a program called Opening Soon at a Theater Near You, which was over by the time we got the title on the screen. And uh, we did it once a month. We sat in uh, director's chairs. We hid behind clipboards. We were both very paranoid, I think. I was afraid I would say something very stupid, and Gene would say something like, that wasn't Fellini, that was Bergman, and I would leave in dismay. Uh, <laughs> eventually, I think we developed a rapport because we became confident that we were working with each other and talking about films. Uh, in the introduction, we use the word adversaries, but in watching the program, I get the feeling that it's not necessarily adversarial pr positions, well, but you do what disagree, we are, you? we are film critics for the competing newspapers in Chicago, mm -hmm. the Sun-Times for Roger, the Tribune for myself. Mm -hmm. We are in competition. We try to get stories in first. We try to write a better review, mm -hmm. better uh, Sunday articles, think pieces. And we try play that very seriously. But most journalists... Uh, when they finish their work, they go to bars and they bitch about the other person. Mm -hmm. We, after we finish our work on Thursdays, go to the studio I have an and talk to together. I to address Gene directly. I can explain his uh, errors and try to correct him. <laughs> <laughs> we talk directly. Then we can go to a bar mm -hmm. if you want afterwards. But we do one day a week. We do talk together. And out of the talking together, we've created something very positive. And I think we have changed. I think the contribution of the show is we have changed the image of film critics. Mm -hmm. We yeah. would rather talk about, most people think critics hate films, are jealous of stars like Christopher Reed, jealous of his looks and all that, mm -hmm. and that uh, we are frustrated, we want to make films, we want to be directors. And no, I like writing, I like writing about movies, I'd rather see a good movie than a bad movie. This, we love this stuff more, why would we see it all? if we didn't love it so much. Yeah, they, that would be a Apart lot of work, the fact that right? get paid. Yeah, that's true too, but you spend a lot of time in dark rooms watching movies. It's something that I enjoy. I love it at nine o'clock in the morning when everybody else is going into their offices with their briefcases and I'm sneaking into a theater with my bucket of popcorn. At nine in the morning? Good. Sure, <laughs> nine o'clock last Christmas morning, I was at the Chicago Theater. Oh, that's a sad, ugly story. Mm -hmm. it, uh, <laughs> I've got more just like it, too. Uh, let me ask you, is it possible for you guys or one or, uh, to, to see a film that you know is good, but to dislike it? And, and I don't know what you mean by that. Say you don't enjoy the film, but you know it's a good one. 
Uh, I saw a movie was called um, Whose Life Is It Anyway? I enjoyed the performance very much. Mm -hmm. I thought Richard Dreyfuss was brilliant in the film. I dis disagreed with the entire premise of the film, which was that he should be allowed to die because he doesn't want to go on living as a quadriplegic. I felt that intellectually the film was dishonest, yet I enjoyed it as an entertainment. So I was really split on that film, and it put me in a very strange position. Even to this moment, I'm kind of on, mm -hmm. the, on the fence with that one. Yeah. I don't have a reaction like that. I, uh, if, if a film is good, for me, that means I have enjoyed it. So I don't have that kind of a split. Yeah. Do you, do you worry about um, somebody shelling out the dough for the wife and the kids or the husband I, You know what kids? I started to do? Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, I started to pay for the movies. The p newspaper reimburses me. But I wanted that little event of taking out the money and noticing that the prices have gone up from four to four and a yeah. half now in New York, five yeah. bucks. And just the fact of doing that makes it makes one less likely to write the sentence, it was this little thing was worth the price of admission, right. because yeah, most yeah. often yeah. it is not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the things that bothers me is these films that come out of places like Utah, like In Search of Historic Jesus, In Search of Noah's Ark. At the end of that film, mm -hmm. they were still searching for Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they spend millions of dollars on the advertising campaign. They get the entire family there. It costs 20 or $25 for tickets. It's a disappointment for everyone. The family feels burned. They don't want to go back and yeah. see a movie like that yeah. again. Those, those weren't or comedies, were they? Either of those weren't musical I comedies? I laughed a lot, but they were not comedies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you gentlemen can hang around for a moment or two, we have to uh, pause. We'll be back with uh, Mr. Siskel and Mr. Ebert. However, at this time, Late Night would like to welcome a new sponsor to our program, Writer, the best truck money can rent or lease. Hi there, and welcome back to the extravaganza. Gene Siskel <laughs> and Roger Ebert are here, and we're talking about your uh, television program, which is Sneak Previews, and uh, a wonderful show. Now, it's PBS. You probably couldn't do that on a commercial uh, operation. We would probably not be able to show so many movies that are not commercial movies. We show documentaries, independent films, and foreign films. If we were on a network, they'd probably want us to show Superman every time. Yeah. There may be a flow, too, that in a continuity we can refer to. We know what you mentioned before. Here's a the same thing going on mm -hmm. in this film, yeah. that if it's interrupted by a commercial, I think mm -hmm. it would make us less likely. And so we would do little, be little uh, pieces and try and hit peaks right before the commercial break, mm -hmm. which is the problem with made-for-TV movies as opposed to regular movies. Right. With, you can have a flow, you can have visual references that can make sense and moments of recognition. These made-for-TV movies, you got to hammer them right before the commercial. Someone's well, going to get nailed. It's see a made-for-TV movie all the way through without commercials because it kind of... Yeah, it's designed uh, like in that framework. Uh, tell me about... Uh, th I show I saw your show, uh, show Saturday <laughs> night, uh, and you disagreed on One from the Heart. Uh, I didn't like it. I felt I agreed with the dentist, as a matter of fact. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was overproduced, and it uh, didn't have enough of the human qualities in it, including teeth, but also heart mm -hmm. and mind. Uh, I thought the actors at all times were overshadowed by Coppola's amazing production, which was great to look at. And I enjoyed the movie on that basis as a technological achievement, but the technology totally dwarf the people in the film. The first time I saw the picture at this big Radio City Music Hall showing here in New York a few weeks ago, I had pretty much that same reaction. I saw it again in Chicago before I reviewed the film. I was told that some changes were made, so I felt that I was obliged to see it again. I had spent more time with the characters then. In effect, I had spent four hours with these characters. And I felt that the more time I spent with them, the more I got to feel for their situation. This is a couple busting apart right at the beginning. And what I really enjoyed about the film was the fantasies. Each person pursues a fantasy. And people who have ever been in uh, relationships that are failing have this drive. And I found that the fantasy figures, Raul Julia for Terry Garr and Nastasia Kinski uh, for Frederick Forrest, that these fantasies were charming. And the drive for fantasy, that, that moment of losing mm -hmm yourself in the fantasy, I thought was very exciting, and I would see the picture a third time. But don't you feel if you're trying to make a lightweight romantic comedy, it's a bit much to ask people to see it twice? Don't you feel that Coppola could have made a film in which the human values and the fun and the fantasy and the escapism would have been there right away? If the first I time. felt that he could have had more in the beginning of the picture, if we're going to follow this couple for two hours, mm -hmm. I felt we should have known them better as the film opens, mm -hmm. and I still say mm -hmm. Uh, that that's what's wrong with the picture. One of the interesting things about our show is trying to make qualified remarks. So much uh, of criticism is simply thumbs up and thumbs down. And I think that one of the things we try and do in a longer discussion on the show 
not just the normal uh, film criticism that you get with one person sitting in front of the camera introducing the film clip and saying it's stuck, is that we try and mo uh, moderate our opinions. Mm -hmm. I do think the film is flawed. There's no question about it. It's just that on our show I have a time to tell you that I did see it a second time mm -hmm. and that it got to me. Can I say Great. something? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think you, your point is an interesting one, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned earlier, Gene, that uh, once you start paying for these suckers, you're a little more um, tentative with uh, Movies aren't that expensive, though. I think $4.50 or $5 today in 1982 is not that expensive compared, compared to, to what plays? I, yeah, I right. just saw a play here over the weekend. 30 40 bucks. bucks. Yeah. 40 bucks. Yeah. And the folks here tonight, what'd you pay? 20, 30 bucks a pop? Yeah, yeah. Just to get in here. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, mention something briefly that I heard uh, Francis Ford Coppola say. He, he said that um, uh, he felt that uh, people were too harsh on filmmakers and that, um, I'm paraphrasing here, he felt that the uh, Michael Cimino film mm -hmm. uh, should have had a chance to be judged by the public. And he felt that the media decimated it. Heaven's early Gate on. was brought to Chicago, to a suburb south of Chicago, for a sneak preview, its second version, and the audience hated it. Mm before the critics got a chance at it the second time around. Yeah. And the audience uh, in that particular suburb had not, wasn't aware of the New York critical reception, didn't know that the returns were already in, had not heard of the film in particular. I think it's an objectively a bad film. They tried no, it it's twice, not a good they film. cut it. Well, his point was, not having seen the film, I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about here, which is true in most <laughs> cases. Um, <laughs> but his point was, a, a film is a piece of art done by a filmmaker, mm -hmm. much as a painting is a piece of art done by a, a painter. And therefore, it should be allowed to hang in the hall right alongside well, all of his other works. That's what he did with One from the Heart. He brought it to Radio City. He played it in Los Angeles. Two audiences who could go up and buy a ticket and walk in and sit down before he had any press screenings or any reviews. Yeah. So I, I honor the fact that he wants to do that. I think it's great that he wants to do that. I, th I think films have a right to be seen. And I don't, with my review, say, don't show it. Yeah. I just say, I can't recommend it. We, yeah. Our language is very specific on the show. I can recommend it. I cannot recommend it. I'm not saying don't go to see it. That's your really, decision. All we really have, have is our opinions, okay. our subjective opinions. Let me, let me move along here to uh, the Academy Award mm. nominations. Anything here? Uh, I'm not looking forward to this year's Oscar cast. I'm not really passionate about any of the films that have been nominated. Which, which ones have been nominated now? Atlantic well, City, Reds, Raiders of the Lost Ark. On Golden Pond. Reds, mm -hmm. and uh, what's the fifth one? Chariots of Fire. Chariots, Thank of, Chariots of Fire. Great film. But and not a, a groundbreaking film. In mm -hmm. years past, with movies like Bonnie and Clyde and Nashville, I've really been involved. I thought those pictures represented something. If you're going to handicap uh, the Oscars, it's going to be Reds versus On Golden Pond. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it makes a difference to me, I don't think to Roger, or maybe even to people here, which wins. Mm -hmm. I think it could be a very dull show. Do you care? Um, <laughs> do I care? Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, gee, I guess I, I'm a sort of, I have to have an opinion here, don't I? Um, <laughs> I, I guess I'm kind of pulling for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I would vote for that. <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, I haven't seen On Golden Pond, so... Mm -hmm. uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was at least pure escapist entertainment. It yeah. was great fun. And as far one as... One of those bruised arm movies. Yeah. Right. People are grabbing you. Yeah. Uh, you know, the one, the, the one that I truly liked, which was, um, I, don't, I guess, not eligible for the Academy Awards this time around, was... The uh, No, the uh, Terry Gilliam film. Uh, Time Bandits. Time Bandits, Time Bandits. yes. Didn't I you think, think it was all on one note? Oh, somebody was going to applaud for it. They, well, that's all right. <laughs> we'll have them taken out back and roughed up. Uh, <laughs> Didn't you feel it was all on one note? The first 15 minutes were terrific, and the rest of the film was just like the first uh, I, I found that hour. To, I found that to be sort of comforting, because mm -hmm. once you understood the premise... You could the, leave and come back and not have missed anything. Mm, no, mm -hmm. I just I found that once you understood the premise, the whole thing just sort of mm -hmm. unfolded in front of you, and it was like a, a smorgasbord. It was a terrific production. Yeah. It was I a thought great it was like your 16-course TV dinner, which, is a, <laughs> which had about too many really? courses. Yeah, that's and, interesting. And, you know, there was a scene on a boat, the Titanic, and yeah. that one I would have taken out. Yeah. A few things like that. But the idea is cute. A child's bedroom yeah. invaded in his dreams. Right. That's uh, fun. Yeah, that's what I meant. Once you, it's a wonderful premise. You can go anywhere with that. What's, <laughs> what's great is that so many different kinds of films find audiences. Yeah. You get Raiders of the Lost Ark, and then you get My Dinner with Andre, both at the same time, hits in their own fields. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you about the film that, uh, or a film that you wrote. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. That's yes, right. One of the ten best films of the 70s, yes. Now, was it really one of the uh, ten... Several, uh, let's see, Richard Corliss, I think, put it on his list of the 10 best films of the set. I think he was the only critic who put it on. <laughs> Is it, uh, was it a quality, well, it must have been. 10 it was best a 20th Century Fox production. It was shot in color. Uh, <laughs> it was, I think of it as the first horror rock exploitation musical. That was, when did you write that? 1969. Now, have you, I would be very disappointed to learn that you guys were now secretly writing films. Is that? I have never written one. 
Uh, I feel that I would have to quit this job and throw it all on the table and go out to Hollywood and write a script. Yeah. I don't think I can do both. Roger? I'm not writing a screenplay right now. Well, it's a load off my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, you guys are terrific. Uh, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. We'll be uh, right back. Thank you.